a sleeper. But in fact, awareness I is neither a sleeper nor a dreamer nor a waker. From its own standpoint, it is always awake, wide awake, it is ever the same. It is not a waker or a dreamer or a deep sleeper. But then with reference to one thing, it is called so. With reference to like even as I said, the fellow is an uncle because of a man. From whose standpoint? You look at yourself. And again from the brother's standpoint, I am brother. Uncle's standpoint, I am, I am a brother-in-law or a cousin and on but not. And again from father's standpoint, son. Like this, I keep on changing my names. And from my own standpoint, I am a simple Henry, not the eighth. You know that story. <laughs> I'm reminded of that song. Last time also I said. So this, one fellow said, I am Henry the eighth, I am, I am. <laughs> Henry the eighth, I am, I am. How come you are Henry the Eighth? I say Henry the Eighth, how you are? Well, you don't know. That Henry the Eighth died long before. But now how come you become Henry the Eighth? You don't know. Henry the Eighth, I am, I am. How? I got married to the widow next door. <laughs> She got married seven times before. <laughs> Everyone was Henry. <laughs> Neither Sam nor Willie. <laughs> Therefore, Henry the eighth, I am I. This fellow is a simple Henry, but become Henry the Eighth, the unfortunate. <laughs> if he looks at himself from the seven other fellows that had that had that, that, that they were the <laughs> understand. <laughs> like this. To say I am tall, I am short, I am mortal, I am limited. You have to look at yourself from this physical body which is a mortal, no doubt, who said it is not. It is born at a given time and it is going to die also at the given time. It is and in between it keeps on dashing towards death. And that is why that fellow, that sculptor made only one single dash. You might have had variegated experiences. In him, it was only one simple dash, one straight line. Born straight, went to death. And that is exactly his, his vision. And thus, this fellow, this physical body, is like that it is subject to change and modify. And therefore, from the physical body standpoint, I can call myself a mortal with a smile within myself. For I know I is not a mortal. And if I say I am a mortal, then it is entirely different thing. To be in association with one thing is one thing. And to take that one thing itself, what, what I am associated with as myself, is quite another. As I told you, a rich man, he can play definitely. In those days, the kings used to come in, 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 uh, in mufti, mufti dress. And then they would not be recognized at all. And thus they would come as beggars and just to find out how the citizens are. That doesn't mean he loses his, his, his kingship. He retains his identity that I am the king, who is going now in the rags that he knows very well. To associate oneself with one thing, with a given costume or a role, is, is, a, is, is, a, is a thing that one can always do. But to take the very role itself as oneself is definitely to invite, invite a self-loss. And here especially, the loss is limitless. It is not a loss that is, that is as limited as the gain. But then the loss is limitless because I am free from forms of limitation. And the body is subject to all kinds of limitation. And if that body is taken as I, definitely I am limited. Once I say I am limited, then what I want? I want to be free from limitation. Natural struggle. I want to be free from limitation. That is the original quest. 
So I am free from limitation. I take myself to be limited. And afterwards, I struggle to free myself from a limitation which doesn't belong to I. Similarly, I take myself the mind, I say, I am restless. I am sorrowful. I am sad. And this, the condition of the mind becomes myself, even though I appreciate what occurs in my mind. Therefore, so again from the mind standpoint, I am limited. From knowledge standpoint, I am limited. From ignorance standpoint, I am limited. There's all limitations I gather to myself, all due to what? Due to sheer self-ignorance, I ignorance, ignorance of myself. In life, we seek three things alone. Note, fundamentally, Three things alone everybody wants is six. One thing is, I want to live a day more. <laughs> Nobody wants to die today. I always want to live a day more. Tomorrow getting up wants to live a day more. In India we have got these shops. Most of the shops will have the signboard. You'll find that the signboard was written when the shop was open originally. And it is there, so in the door inside, and it opens, it comes out. It is written there, today cash, tomorrow credit. <laughs> <laughs> One fellow went there to get something on credit. And he saw this board, and he said, tomorrow, okay, tomorrow I will come. And he went tomorrow, <laughs> today cash, tomorrow credit. Again, the same board hangs there. Tomorrow never comes. Today alone comes. <laughs> and therefore, so this is exactly that this today, today there is the tomorrow. Tomorrow credit means there is no such thing as tomorrow. All the time it is today alone. The fellow is finished. <laughs> he, he can't. Because that tomorrow never comes. That means what? A man wants to live eternally. When you say that I want to die tomorrow, you want to die, you don't want to die. That is, all, that, is, that is what it is. The heart is something that doesn't accept death. Otherwise, you will never weep for a man who is dead and gone. Because when you weep for a man that is dead, you think that you are very permanent. Is it not? Otherwise, you can't weep. He is dead and gone. He opens his mouth to weep. Where is the guarantee that he is going to be there to close the mouth? <laughs> Died, he said. He received the news. So he died. Another casualty. <laughs> when the heart stops, it doesn't take time, please. It just stops. Now, that be the fellow weeps because he thinks he's more permanent than the other fellow. And he is dead and gone. It's all false notions. And again, that I want a son. Why? Because in the son, I want to leave myself behind. It's also a strange, a strange what you call, he doesn't want to erase himself completely from this earth. One day when I die away, I won't be there at all. There will be nothing left behind. At least if a son is there, then so I am in my image, my image is left behind. Therefore, even the desire for son, I would say is a desire for immortality. He wants to leave something behind. At least he will, he will just get into a symmetry. And then that is why they buy from in, on installment basis, I am told, a place in the symmetry, in a good place. Is it not? A burial ground. A place, because it's very costly. So now, now one, the fellow 40th year onwards, he pays in small installments of $10, $10, $10, and so that he will get a place there. Why do you want to go there? Something will be left behind. So and so is lying here. And then, in fact, one Swami in Rishikesh, he, he created a place of Samadhi for him. Samadhi means the burial. So he created a place for, for, his, for himself. First he created, and then he died. So that 
the, the disciples will not throw the body into the Ganga. So then it was, he was buried there. So he wanted to be there. He means what? <laughs> I don't understand that anyway. So he wanted to be there. And therefore, what I say, so this, this love for eternity, that I want to live always a day more because my vision is always in eternity. I can't accept death. I can't take myself to be a mortal. Because I, therefore, this is one desire. I want to live a day more. That means I am a mortal and I have accepted, therefore, I want to be immortal. I don't want to erase myself. I'm a mortal. This is number one. Number two is, he always wants to know. He can't stand ignorance. And whatever ignorance he has got, he, has, he can't stand it. Once he knows I'm ignorant of this, he wants to know. Even, suppose there is a small little fight or something going on, he goes and stands there, wants to know. Even though there is nothing to do with it, wants to know what's going on. A small little, some leaflet is given, and in the street, then he picks it up, wants to know, then throws it back. <laughs> wants to know. Nothing should go around without my knowing. Otherwise, newspapers will not sell. You want to know. What I say is, that love for knowledge is always there for this man. So I want to live a day more. I can't stand and brook ignorance. I want to know more I know. More I want to know. Then again, thirdly, I want to be happy. Granted life, still I want to be happy. If that is not there, I am ready to give up life. Suicide. I want to live and live happily also. Therefore, I seek happiness all the time. This is the third thing. I want to live, I want to live eternally because the desire, fear of death is always there. That is because I take myself to be a mortal even though I am free from mortality. The body is taken for I, then I become mortal and afraid of mortality. I is placed in its own place. It is removed from the body and appreciated as I free from time. Then one problem is gone. The problem of mortality and death is not for I. Again, problem I take myself, I'm ignorant, and then struggle to become full in terms of knowledge, whereas I am not ignorant, I am knowledge because of which I know my ignorance and knowledge. I am not ignorance, understand? I am is not ignorance. I am is awareness. I am is knowledge because of which I know my ignorance and knowledge. And therefore, I have no limitation. I, that I has no limitation of ignorance. The intellect may have the limitation of ignorance and knowledge. I am free from the limitation of ignorance for I am the one because of which ignorance is, knowledge is. And therefore, in me is ignorance and knowledge. Means in the I, because of I is ignorance and knowledge. I itself is free from ignorance and knowledge for it is in the form of awareness. And again, thirdly, we want, therefore, so I am awareness, and I suffer, I take myself to be ignorant, and then suffer the limitation of ignorance. Whereas I am is knowledge, because of which I know my ignorance and knowledge, and therefore, I have no limitation of ignorance and knowledge. Thirdly, that I want to be happy. Now, happiness is another thing that we always think it is something outside. We have to get happiness from outside. This is another unfortunate thing. So no object in this world, analyze, no object in this world can be dubbed as a source of happiness. No object in this world can be taken as a source of happiness. If there is one object, all of us can contact that object and get happiness. <laughs> if there is one, any one object, it is not there at all. What do you consider as a source of happiness? He is looked upon by another man 
as a source of sorrow? And again, what do you look upon as a source of happiness today may be looked upon by you tomorrow as a source of sorrow? You might have quoted something today and tomorrow you may just get rid of it also because you say that, oh, this is, I never knew what it was involved. And it all depends how you look upon a given object. And that object seems to give me happiness. Like even a dog picked up a bone, as the story goes, a dog picked up a dry bone and began biting this bone. And as it was biting, so from its own mouth, because of the dry bone, so it injured its mouth and out of the wounds, its own blood was coming. And the dog licked the blood and took the bone for meat. Hey, meat. I don't know whether the dog would do that, but anyway. So he took the, he took the bone for meat. I asked the dog, I said, I say, what, what were you eating? Meat. <laughs> meat. Did you eat meat? Yes. How? Because it, was, it had a lot of blood in it. How is that? I tasted blood there. How? Because before I, I began biting the bone, there was no taste of blood. Or you see the argument. Before I began biting the bone, there was no taste of blood. After biting the bone, there was a taste of blood. Therefore, the blood must belong to the anything that I was biting. <laughs> bone, bone, it doesn't know. And therefore, anything. Before biting the thing, there was no blood. And after, uh, and after biting alone, I had the taste of blood. Therefore, it should be meat. Exactly like this. I wanted something. That something, I got it. When I got that, there was a clearance in me. I was happy. Before experiencing the object, I was not that happy. After experiencing the object, I became happy. And therefore, happiness should belong to what? Should belong to the object. The difference between the dog and the man is, when the dog suffers, he is taken to a vet, and this fellow he suffers, he is taken to a general physician. That is the only difference, because the logic is the same. The logic is the same in the inasmuch as, well, he says that before the arrival, on, in the wake of the experience of the object, I got happiness. And therefore, happiness should belong to the object. If it belongs to the object, whoever comes in contact with that object should find happiness. You yourself should come into contact with the same object again and see whether it gives you the same happiness. No, it doesn't do. Your experience proves that. Therefore, the same object which gave you happiness before doesn't give you now because your mind has changed. Therefore, what is the content of it? You think, suppose you want something. And now this one thing you have been eating, suppose. So you want this particular thing to eat for a long time. And you got it. When you got it, oh, fine, beautiful and all that, it gave you a kick. Some happiness, some pleasure. If not happiness, some pleasure. The second one, the same thing. A repetition. Second one was given, the same thing was given to him. Second time, okay, it's fine. Third time, Thing remaining the same, the fellow, if he's a glutton, he may accept ten times. The same thing. Ten cakes, okay. So, ten of them he accepted. The eleventh one, he says, no. I am not interested. Why well, keep it there, we will see tomorrow. <laughs> Today, why? No, I can't stand it. Why? Because it is not the object. If the first, in fact, you know the law of diminutive utility. The first one, the first one gives you a kick. The second one, little less. The third one, still less. The fourth one, still less. The fifth one, still less. And the tenth one, you can't stand the sight of it. <laughs> Take it away. Why? The tenth one, poor thing. Suppose the tenth one had come first, you would have accepted it, is it not? 
Not the tenth one had committed any sin. It is the same as the first one. But then the tenth one, you, it doesn't give you anything. First one gave. Why? Not the first one he is better winged than the second one, the tenth one. It is the same thing as the tenth one is. But then you wanted it. There was appetite in you. And therefore it gave you a kick all right. But then the object itself doesn't have any content of happiness. You know this very well in, in, at, at home. When the mother cooks the food and one fellow jumps, oh, today he's very happy. The other fellow is depressed. Did you do that? <laughs> now you can understand from this very clear. The object itself has nothing to do to make you happy or anything. But then you want something and that want is fulfilled. There is a clearance in you. The want is no more until you pick up another want. The want is cleared away. The mind is free and you find a joy for it. And at that moment of happiness, the object is not. Much less, you are the one, you remember, I am so and so, now I am enjoying it. You are not there. In fact, if it is a one complete flame of joy, in that flame of joy, the enjoyer is consumed, the enjoyed consumed, the enjoyment itself is not recognized. It is only what reminds is I myself become a flame of joy. Where all differences seem to resolve. The experiencer and the experienced, the enjoyer and the enjoyed become together. When there is such a unity, when there is such a consummation, where differences resolve, I find there is joy. What I wanted is no more separate from me, and therefore the wanting man and the wanted object, as long as they are separate, there is pang in your heart. The heart burns. It wants, it pans for it wants. It longs for the object. Because it looks upon the object as something that is very important for me, being happy. And the object is gained. No more I am a seeker with reference to that object. The seeker sought come to be one. The mind is no more projecting. And in that resolved mind, there is a joy manifest. Belongs to whom? Not to the object. <laughs> Definitely not to the object. But belongs to whom? Belongs to myself, please. I am happiness. I am joy, which is not granted a chance to manifest itself in my mind. When the mind gets the clearance, the joy manifests itself. And there I say I am all joy. And again the projecting mind, the wanting, longing mind, the imputing that happiness to an object, it again projects that I want that again, because it knows not I am indeed what I seek. The fullness of the joy that I seek is myself alone, the mind doesn't know, and therefore again, it's, it wants to gain the same happiness. For once you have experienced your height, you would definitely go to, you would, you would make an attempt to reach the same height, as I told you before. At moments of happiness, I become all happiness. A man who wanted to just to see something, and he go to a temple, and he, and a Hindu, he wanted to go to a temple in Badrinath, and he went to the temple. When he went to the till then, it was a great separation between him and the Lord. He wanted to see the Lord in the Himalayas in that particular shrine. He was a great devotee. And he got, got to Badri, the place, and then when he saw the Lord, he closed the eyes, and then the Lord disappeared. In that particular form, the Lord disappeared. And himself, I am a devotee who has come here, all the way from the south and things like that, all his weariness and his tiredness, all these things are forgotten. What remains is the seeker sought consumed into one of fullness. That fullness alone remains. No difference remains. Therefore, the Lord seems to have become the very fullness that he was seeking for. When the seeker and the sought become one, you find that there is joy. That joy is not born out of an object outside. It is a condition I grant within myself, in my mind, which does not deny me, which doesn't deny me the joy that I am. Like even, I see the sun, now I don't see the sun. 
Why? Because a patch of clouds. This patch of clouds seems to now cover the sun. The sun seems to have disappeared and a fellow cries and he says the sun is gone. And I don't know where is he gone. Will he come back? This fellow, for yes, one also he, he cries. Sun is gone, my son went to the school, never came back. I don't know what happened to him. Kidnapped perhaps because there is a scare now. And therefore, kidnapped, thus he is now for this son also, S-U-N. And this fellow cries now. Though son is gone, what will happen? Will he come back? I don't think he will come back. Why, why? He is completely gone. He is not there at all. Then he prayed to the Lord. Oh Lord, minus son. Without son, how we are going to live on this earth? Please bless us with the son. You have take, he has gone away somewhere. Please bring him back. Then there was a kindly breeze and the son came back. And he said, well, the Lord came in the form of breeze and caught the ears of the son and brought him back. <laughs> the son was brought into being by the wind. Is it true? Is it true? The wind brought the sun into being. Will you accept? No. But the wind has made me see, helped me see the sun. In which way? In which way? In the sense, it removed the clouds. The cloud was standing between me and the sun. The wind came and removed the clouds. I had clearance. I saw the bright sun. In my mind, there is a cloud of desire. In the fulfillment of the desire, in the wake of the object desired, achieved, the desire cloud moves away. I find the sun of joy manifest. And again, the projecting mind projects. It seems as though myself, the Ananda, is gone somewhere. That is the reason why my being ananda or the, or the joy or fullness, when I go to sleep, I discover such a great, such a great joy or happiness. Everybody is interested in deep sleep. Nobody is disinterested, please. That is why they sleep all over. <laughs> Not in the bus they sleep, in the car they sleep, in the office, of course they sleep. And everywhere the fellows sleep. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because sleep is a field of a happy experience. I give you the logic. I give you the logic. Logic is a man makes lot of effort for getting into something, gaining an experience in which he expects to get some kick, some pleasure. You will never make a deliberate effort to get into a field of sorrow. This fellow drives 10 miles in a car to what? To get himself whipped by somebody. That fellow gives every day 25 whip, 25 lashes. So for, for these 25 lashes, to get the 25 lashes, he went driving and came back. Is it true? <laughs> Nobody makes an attempt, a deliberate effort, to get into a state where there is unhappiness. Man is an utilitarian. He means business all the time. And he wants to get into always a state of, a state of experience wherein there is some kick, there is some pleasure, there is some happiness. Now please see this man who goes to sleep. Very elaborate arrangements he makes. The bed must be pakka. The light must be the right one. Everything, the height of the pillow must be the same. And everything is all speak and span, everything is fine. Then he goes to sleep. Why? Because I want sleep. And for which all these arrangements are made. You see that fellow making his bed and things like that, his own bed, suppose he makes. Please see him, how carefully he makes everything. Because it is something like, when you go to the kitchen and cook and things like that, what for? To eat. Have the pleasure of eating. Similarly, this fellow, 
So he makes such elaborate arrangements, takes so much pain to see everything is fine so that he can sleep. Therefore, the sleep should be a state of what? Sorrow. Happiness. Okay. In the morning, suppose there is a, a man is with a field of happiness, experiencing some happiness in listening to something, listening to music or listening to a commentary of the baseball. <laughs> suppose he is listening to that. Now this fellow, suppose he, you ask him to come out of it, he will not come. Or looking at a t TV movie. A movie. He is just seeing the TV and now there is a movie going on. And this fellow, you ask him to come to eat, mm -hmm. he won't come. Why he won't come? Because he has a kick here. If at all, he says, all right, bring the food here. <laughs> Why? This I can't get away. See, where there is a field, a kick is there, then he doesn't want to leave it. He's reluctant to leave a thing in which he finds a kick. And he's all anxiety to enter into a field in which there is some kick. This is exactly what it is. The man when he goes to sleep, he is so very careful that everything is fine so that he can have nice sleep. In the morning, you all know it very well. Morning when this fellow wakes up, then afterwards it is a great war. All through your lifetime the war goes on. It's a great fight. Now should I get up now or not? Every day, every day. <laughs> you wake up first and then you think, I, I think another half an hour I think I can. <laughs> so after all, it's only five now. Five fifteen is enough just to have a cash and then go. <laughs> This is everyday affair. It is not one day I tell you, everyday affair all through your lifetime when you get up, you don't want to get up, wake up first, get up later, in between, my God. <laughs> he had good intentions. He told somebody, please just give me tea at six o'clock. That poor thing brought the tea. And this fellow, this fellow at six o'clock, so since he had asked her to bring, give tea, and he got up and he took tea all right at six o'clock and then he closed the door again went to sleep. <laughs> we see this all the time. Because waking up is one thing, getting up is another. And in between ages can go. And therefore, and therefore that means I am reluctant to take back the cross that I had laid down. When I enter into it, I am so very happy to enter into that sleep. When I want to get out of it, I am so reluctant to come out of it. That means that sleep must be a source of, a state of some kind of happiness. True it is. <laughs> there is freedom from all limitation. There is a fullness. There is a joy in it. There is a known joy of everybody. And that fullness is, doesn't differ from man to man. Whether you sleep the most informed person, or the other fellow sleeps who is ignorant man, ignoramus. But both the fellows, both the fellows when they gain sleep, both of them are one and the same. No division whatsoever. All forms of duality resolve. In the deep sleep, Differences, Bhagavan, myself, all, Ishwara, Lord, all these things, all, all resolve into one, one state of experience where there is freedom from all forms. Everybody is interested in it. That joy that you get there in deep sleep, from where did you get? From where did you get? Is it because of your physical body, so shapely, beautiful body that you have? Is it because of an experience of an object that you had? Is it because of your intellectual accomplishments that you, that you found yourself happy there? No. 
You are dead to your body, you are dead to the world, you are dead to your memories, you are dead to your knowledge. You may be a great musician, all right, outside, but then in sleep you have no music, otherwise you won't snore that way. <laughs> shapely, beautiful body that you have? Is it because of an experience of an object that you had? Is it because of your intellectual accomplishments that you, that you found yourself happy there? No. You are dead to your body, you are dead to the world, you are dead to your memories, you are dead to your knowledge. You may be a great musician, all right, outside, but then in sleep you have no music, otherwise you won't snore that way. <laughs> That snoring has no pitch at all. He says, it is apashruti, it is called. Shruti just keeps on changing. Krrr, brr, and all that. It has no basis. But you tell that fellow you were snoring like this, he will swear, I didn't snore. <laughs> no fellow says that I snore. snore. Nobody says. Because when, when he snores, he is not there. And you tape record and tell that fellow, this is your snoring. Still you will say, this is not my snoring, it's all confused. <laughs> well, what I say, there the musician is no more a musician. And the Shruti, the Upanishad tells, Andaha Anando Bhavati. The blind man is no more blind. There's a beauty. It's a very nice way of putting it. The blind man is no more blind. Is it not true? In deep sleep, the blind man is no more blind. That I was blind previously, I don't know that I am blind now. Because everybody else also is blind there. And thus the blind man is no more blind. The rich man is no more rich. The poor man is no more poor. The fat man is no more fat. The lean man is no more lean. Then what is there? One, one experience wherein there is no duality. Advaita, this is called Advaita. Where there is no second thing at all. And thus this experience is something that gives me joy, wherein I am with myself alone. I am not with anything else. I am with myself, even though I don't know. I am with myself. There is experience of myself in which there is a content of fullness. And this naturally, therefore, I love to have. And when I come back, I find that fullness is not found anywhere in myself. I begin searching for it naturally, because that is my height. I know what it is to be free from all forms of limitation. And how am I going to settle for anything less? I am not going to compromise for anything less because I have seen my height. Every individual has seen his height. Nobody is denied of this, this, this fullness. And therefore, so this fullness is not something that is apart from myself. It is the very self that is the very nature of myself. In my life I seek ananda because I take myself to be sorrowful. And I take myself to be a sorrowful man, I begin seeking ananda. And ananda is myself. What I seek is only three things. I want to live a day more. I want to get rid of ignorance. I want to get rid of dukkha, sorrow. And what I am is, I am, I am free from the, from the hold of time. I am free from the influence of time. I am the content of time itself, which is timelessness. And therefore, I am free from mortality. And again, I am knowledge itself, because of which I know ignorance. And therefore, limitation of ignorance doesn't belong to me. I is free from ignorance and the objective knowledge. Therefore, I am free from ignorance, hence the limitation of ignorance doesn't belong to me. And I am fullness. And it is a fullness that escapes to my mind often. When there is no projection on the part of my mind, the mind abides in its own glory. And at that time there is fullness, knowingly or unknowingly. Whether I know it or not, whenever there is a clearance in my mind, I find some joy. And the fellow being ignorant of himself, naturally wants to be happy, wants to be full, for he has taken himself to be a sorrowful fellow. Once he takes himself to be sorrowful, he would make an attempt to become full for, as fullness, he has the experience of fullness in deep sleep and at those moments of joy. Therefore, what I seek is what I 
am. What I seek is what I am. Therefore, I am Sat, I am Chit, I am Ananda. This is what they call Satchidananda. Understand? Satchidananda. Now, names people have got Satchidananda. Ask them to explain what it is. <laughs> then you will find what it is. This is, it is not something that has got, it has got to be seen. It is not a Sat is a word. Unless what it is unfolded, the Sat is not a word at all. Chit and Ananda, these are the three words that exactly reveal my nature. For three things I want to seek in life, all the three things fundamentally sought. Not immediate seeking I am talking. This is a fundamentally what I seek in my life is indeed myself. If the fundamental problem of man is solved, then all other problems are no problems at all. They are all things to be faced, things to be tackled, because fundamentally I have no problem at all. It is something like a man on the stage retaining his, his self-identity. If he has to die, and he will die also there in the stage, you know, that fellow, he has got a toy pistol also. And then he makes a big noise. He receives a bullet and then dies away. And then when the screen is up, the fellow gets up. <laughs> the screen is down, the fellow gets up. Because he knew that he didn't die. Otherwise, nobody will be the, will be the target of a, of, a, of a shot, of a fellow shooting. And because he willingly, I will die, don't bother. You please shoot, I will die, he says. So because he knows that he's going to get up. And this similarly, all problems become problems apparent. And therefore, none of them can really affect him because I is already released. Therefore, Bhagavan says, Arjuna, idam shariram kaunteya, kshetra mitya vidhiyate, yetad yo veti, yeta etati this shariram, yaha veti yaha janati, the one who knows, he is called kshetragnya miti tadvidaha. Those who know the kshetra and the kshetragnya, those who don't confuse between the two, the one who takes the one as one, the other is other, and this, even though they are in association, is like even the iron ball which is red hot. You can say the iron ball is hot. Ayo dahati. The iron burns. Dahati means burns. Ayo means iron. The iron burns. So when the ayo dahati, when you say the iron burns, how can the iron burn? Well, iron burns. Then how, do you, how, how does it burn? Well, the fire burns. He doesn't get confused. He knows the iron doesn't burn but it is a fire that burns. And there, even though they are together seen, the iron and the fire, because the iron ball is red hot, both of them are together seen. The fire is not inside or not outside. It is all over the iron ball. But at the same time, he knows, even though they are together, it is a fire that burns, not the iron, please. And again, it is a fire ball, when you say, no, no, no. The fire is not ball, the iron is ball. And again, the iron, if fire is ball, then wherever there is fire, it should be in the size of a ball. But then the fire is not a ball, and therefore the weight of it belongs to the iron, the size of it belongs to the iron, the brilliance belongs to the fire, the heat belongs to the fire, and thus he distinguishes both of them and untakes both of them, even though they are together, this is called viveka jnana. Knowledge of one thing, so where there are two things mixed up, then what the, both of them should be separately known. And again they are together all right, but then separately known. One is one, the other is other. This is called Viveka Jnanam, means a knowledge born of discrimination. There is a difference between simple knowledge and discriminative knowledge. A simple knowledge of a book is a book. But then if there is a confusion between one thing and the other, then when they are mixed up together, then if I separate them, analyze them, and then understand one as one, the other is other, even though they are together, and that is called discriminative knowledge. And here also he says, Tadvidaha, those who know the Kshetra and the Kshetragnya, they point out that the Kshetragnya, the I, the knower of the Kshetra, he is indeed free from the Kshetra, he is the one who knows everything. And Bhagavan says further, Arjuna understand, Kshetragnyam Chapimam Vidhi, Sarva Kshetra Shubharata, So Kshetra Kshetra Gnya Yor Gnanam, Yatta Gnanam Matamam. Then he says, So Kshetra Kshetra Gnya Yor Gnanam. So understand Arjuna, So Kshetra Gnyam Chapimam Vidhi, Sarva Kshetra Shubharata, He Bharata, 
भा भा मीन्स भारत मीन्स भारत भारत इज इंडिया भारत मीन्स भा इज दिस नॉलेज दिस नॉलेज ऑफ ब्रह्मन इज कॉल्ड नॉलेज ऑफ आत्मा इज कॉल्ड भा प्रकाश आत्मिका भा सो दैट विच इज दैट विच ब्लेसेस यू विथ नॉलेज दैट इज कॉल्ड भा ब्रह्म विद्या एंड इन दैट नॉलेज सेल्फ नॉलेज द वन हु रेवल्स इज कॉल्ड भारत है अर्जुना यू हैव बीन हियरिंग नाउ फॉर द पास्ट दिस ट्वेल्व चैप्टर इज यू टॉक टू हिम and therefore you are reveling in this vidya and therefore he addresses him hey bharat the one who listens to this vidya to this knowledge hey bharat understand me i am the one who is in all hearts kshetrajnam chapi mam vidhi so only one awareness that is there because of which you are aware of your ignorance your memories your emotions your sense organs your body and my body and the distance between the your body and my body and similarly